This tutorial looks at how rate of reaction can be measured. You have to know the units for measuring rate of reaction, for example in grams per second or in cubic centimetres per second, and apply the correct unit at the correct time. Some chemical reactions make gas, and in this case we collect the gas and measure the volume of gas over a period of time, for example uh, every 10 seconds or so. We get a graph a little like this with time along the bottom and the volume of carbon dioxide up the side. We can see that the rate of reaction is faster to the beginning, slows down as the concentration of the reactants reduces until eventually it stops uh, when one or both of the reactants have been used up. In the previous case there were cubic centimetres up the left hand side and seconds along the bottom so the rate would be measured in cubic centimetres per second. If we wanted to measure, for example, the rate of reaction over the first 30 seconds, we'd draw a triangle up from 30 seconds and across from the graph to find out the volume and the rate would be the volume over time, in other words the left hand over the bottom axis, and that would be 40 cubic centimetres divided by 30 seconds, so that would be 1.33 cubic centimetres per second. In this chemical reaction the uh, gas is being produced but it's not being collected, it's being lost and the mass of the flask is going down over time. So let's have a look at what the graph of that reaction would look like. And here because I've reversed the scale on the left hand side the mass is dropping over a period of time until eventually the reaction has finished. It's finished around here when it is leveled off at after 150 seconds. Here however because the uh, left hand scale was in grams and the bottom scale was in seconds the units of rate would be in grams lost per second or grams per second. Again measuring the rate of the reaction over the first 30 seconds we would draw a uh, up from 30 seconds and across to 0.5 so we can see that we've lost 0.5 grams in 30 seconds so the rate here would be the mass lost divided by the time and here it would be 0.5 grams per 30 seconds and that would equal 0.0167 grams per second. So various kinds of chemical reactions can be followed over time by measuring, for example, the volume of gas produced uh, every 10 seconds or the mass lost every 10 seconds and the units will be related to the uh, units that you're measuring. There is one other kind of reaction which you can't measure the rate of as the reaction goes on. This is one that uh, you have to measure only the time for completion. In this case, uh, this is called the disappearing cross experiment where sodium thiosulfate reacts with acid and produces a thickening precipitate of sulfur. We just take the time taken for the cross to be obscured. and In this case, you can tell which is the fastest reaction by it taking the shortest time to complete. But generally speaking, the rate of a reaction measures how much product is formed in a fixed time period or per second, and common units are grams per second and cubic centimetres per second. Of course, for slower reactions, it might be per minute or even per hour. You need to be able to interpret data in graphs or in tables to find out whether one reaction is faster than another. You'll be expected to interpret graphs such as this one. Uh, you can see that the reaction here is fast at the beginning because the gradient is at its steepest. The reaction slows down as time goes on because the concentration of one or other of the reactants is being uh, reduced until eventually the reaction finishes. No more products are formed because one or both of the reactants has been used up. Sometimes you might have to interpret data in a table. Here, for example, if we look at the 20 second time, you can see that over the first 20 seconds at 20 degrees we've got 26 cubic centimetres of gas whereas at 30 degrees we've got 51. So quite clearly comparing two bits of data from the table tells us that the reaction at 30 degrees is faster. 
We can also look at the time taken to complete the reaction. You can see that here at the bottom, 20 degrees, it's taken 120 seconds to complete the reaction because it doesn't go up from 80 beyond that. Whereas at 30 degrees, the reaction is complete at 80 seconds, so that's the faster of the two reactions. Now we'll return to calculating the rate of reaction a second time and we'll also look at how we can uh, extrapolate or interpolate graphs to get more data from them. Often we're asked to find out the rate of reaction over a period of time here over the first 10 seconds. So what we do is we draw a graph showing a triangle over the first 10 seconds and we see that the difference in mass is 1 gram and the difference in time is 10 seconds and therefore the rate equals the change in mass over the change in time which is 1.0 gram over 10 seconds which is 0 0.1 grams per second. Here we've got two graphs again over the first 10 seconds shall we say. In the first case for graph A then we draw a graph for the first 10 seconds Sorry, this is so poorly drawn. And in the first 10 seconds, we've got, say, 22 cubic centimetres in 10 seconds. So that would be 2.2 cubic centimetres per second. Whereas for graph B, drawing the same graph here for a triangle, it would be 6 cubic centimetres in 10 seconds. And this would therefore be 0.6 cubic centimetres per second. So comparing the rate in cubic centimetres per second, you can see that graph A is showing a reaction which is roughly three and a half times faster than graph B. Now on to extrapolation and interpolation. Now extrapolation means where you extend a graph to include further points. So if you've got a straight line, this is fairly easy. You can extend the line and therefore you can assume that future events will be similar to the past events and that we can assume if there's no changes to any of the conditions. For example, if we were to heat up some water and we could take data over a period of the first 50 uh, minutes and we can see that the water is rising by 10 degrees uh, for every 10 minutes. So you could maybe assume that with the same heater, then the temperature would continue to rise at the same rate. So we're extrapolating the graph there in blue. In physics, sometimes we extrapolate a graph uh, to include further points, and if there is a um, mathematical relationship between the two bits of data, then it's fairly easy to see that you can extrapolate the graph because all points would be valid, such as on this one, where as you increase the length of a pendulum, the time squared increases uh, proportionally. It's a little more tricky to extrapolate curves, particularly into future periods where um, here we can see that there's uh, an exponential growth in the population. Uh, could we assume that the population was going to continue to grow? But maybe it might not if there were uh, other extraneous reasons such as disease that might cause the uh, population to reduce suddenly. Um, Generally speaking, though, you would just continue to draw the curve and continue to extend the uh, curve in the same kind of way as it's being drawn uh, already. Of course, business uses extrapolation all the time in order to uh, predict what their future sales will be based upon past sales. Uh, not always successfully, if we're to look at some of the mobile phone companies, of course. And those of you that watch Dragon's Den will know that uh, the Dragons are forever asking people to give a clear extrapolation of their future profits so that they know whether this is a business to be invested in. You might need to extrapolate a graph such as this one where you have to show what happens at a lower temperature or a lower concentration or larger pieces. The reaction would be slower, you'd continue it, but it would still continue to give you the same total amount of products. Interpolation is more straightforward and you're more used to this. This involves adding imaginary data points between ones you know or, or essentially reading off a graph. Here's an example exam question. It says look at the graph of Viviana's results. How long does it take to make 50 cubic centimetres of carbon dioxide? Now here's the trick. This one actually you read across because the volume, the 50 cubic centimetre volume is on the left hand side and again the scale is a little more tricky. Let's get it on the right line there. Reading across from 50 and then down this line here. 
Now that comes to 40 plus 3 squares, but each square on both scales is 2, in this case 2 seconds, that's 42, 44, 46 seconds. Finally in this tutorial, the idea that the amount of product you get is related to the amount of reactant that you use, and if one of the reactants runs out first, that's called the limiting reactant, and that's the one that decides how much product you get. In this first example, the marble chips are reacting with acid, but the marble chips are in excess in both cases. That means there's too much of them. And that means that the acid is the limiting reactant. Now the difference between the two uh, situations is that Acid A is 50 cubic centimetres of a 200 grams per cubic decimeter acid, whereas acid B is the same volume but half the concentration. Now because there's half the concentration of acid B, that means there's half as many particles of the acid, and as it's the acid which decides how much product we get, there's going to be half as much product made. And that's why the graph for B uh, levels off at half the volume of gas as does the uh, reaction for A. However, because A is also more concentrated acid, A has got a steeper graph um, showing a faster rate of reaction. In this final case, I've reversed the situation here. The magnesium is the fixed amount. So there's a fixed amount, 0.12 grams of magnesium. That's the limiting reactant, and the acid is in excess. So, because we're using the same mass of magnesium each time, we get the same volume of gas produced at each case, and they all level off at the same point. However, because A is more concentrated than B, and B is more concentrated than C, the curve for A is much steeper than B, which is again much steeper than C. But they do all finish at the same volume, because that is fixed by the amount of the magnesium, which is all used up at the end of the reaction, the magnesium, the limiting reactant.